Hello and welcome everyone to the KubeCon Europe session of SIG App Delivery. This session will be co-presented by Lei Sang or Harry and myself. So let's get started. When people look at the CNCF landscape, they easily get overwhelmed by what they see. Some people even made a joke and created a 1000 piece puzzle. There is a large number of tools in the landscape. Some seem to be doing the same thing and it seems to be kind of hard figuring out what the individual tools are doing and how they're helping. And especially when you want to get started on something like app delivery, you might not know where to start because there's just so much or so many tools to start from. On the other hand, there's a great variety of tools. So for your specific purpose, there might be just the right tool there. And you can also try different tools and see which one fits your needs best. And there's always growing functionality. So new tools are constantly added to the landscape, which might help you for your very specific use case. Still, we understand that it's hard to keep track of this. That's why we started for the last KubeCon, so for KubeCon North America, to build a little project called Potato Head, which you can find on the URL that you see here on the slide. It gives you an idea of what cloud native uh, app delivery looks like in the CNCF landscape. So what it does, it provides a very simple, small application, but the uniqueness is you can use app delivery concepts with a variety of tools from the CNCF landscape. You can obviously start with Manifest, you can use Helm, Flux2, Argo, CD and Rollouts, Captain, Cubevela, and recently new tools were added like Gimlet, Litmus Chaos, and there's also support for um, very specific deployment approaches like CNAP using Porta. So you can see that you have this simple project and you can try a variety of tools easily. And this project is also constantly growing. If you're interested to learn more about Potato Head, how it's working, so I highly recommend you either go to the Potato Head GitHub repository or you watch the talk from KubeCon North America where we walk through those examples. Now, for this KubeCon, we took it a step further and we talked to the individual uh, projects, what trends they are seeing, what developments they are seeing, and put this into this session to give you an update of how the landscape for app delivery is really evolving. And here we also want to thank those projects who shared some trends, some stats on how these projects are evolving, what they're seeing in the market, which we condensed into this presentation. This is more or less a very easy uh, step forward uh, approach to get like an insight of all of what's going on in that space. So let's look at the trends now. We categorize them into three areas. The first one, is application definition. So how do we define applications in Kubernetes? What we can clearly see that templating is becoming more and more prominent and more and more front and center, mainly for reuse and simplification. As more people are starting to use Kubernetes and Kubernetes related tools, they slightly get overwhelmed with all the configuration they need to make, especially when it's about production ready workloads. That's why teams start to build templates that contain the major parts that you need to do in order to set up a secure and well-functioning workload in Kubernetes. And you as a developer only need to bring your development uh, specific artifacts like your containers and so forth. Also Kubernetes starts to be used as a management plane for more resources than just the Kubernetes resources. There's tools like Crossplane that allow you to manage um, workloads that are not Kubernetes specific, that also configure cloud resources. So Kubernetes becomes more of a management plane beyond uh, just containers. Also application definitions is moving beyond infrastructure. As we move more towards a developer experience, uh, we obviously need different constructs. We want to model an application, an API service and so forth. And there are numerous projects who do exactly this for you and help you to do this in a better way. On the app delivery side, we see that GitOps adoption is constantly growing and also the use cases get more mature. So it's no longer about just having a simple Git repo synced uh, into your Kubernetes cluster and the proper files being deployed. Use cases with multi-stage delivery and other scenarios are becoming way more front and center, allowing you to handle way more complex enterprise scale delivery scenarios. Also progressive delivery 
is becoming more front and center. So people started from simple deployments on Kubernetes, then moving to blue-green deployments, and now using more and more data to decide whether deployment should stay in production and how traffic should be shifted uh, to this workload. Also, operational concerns take more front and center. As more people keep running production workloads in Kubernetes, what we're obviously seeing that there are some operational concerns uh, that need to be handled that go beyond what Kubernetes does as a platform and also go beyond deployment, simply coping with traditional operational things you have to take care of. On the tooling side, Kubernetes is really becoming more of a platform than just running Kubernetes-based uh, workloads. It's really becoming this platform to build platforms. It starts to introduce higher level uh, abstractions by adding additional tools on top. Also, chaos engineering is becoming more front and center and being tighter integrated into Kubernetes application delivery processes. And last but not least, service catalogs help to really scale the adoption of Kubernetes. As we move more into the templating space, you need to store those templates somewhere, easily fetch them and apply them to your project. So now I'm passing over to Harry, who will walk you through especially what is done from an application definition, from a developer-centric experience, and how different projects um, are em emerging there, and which trends we're seeing, especially in this space. Thank you, Alois. Hello, everyone. So it's really great for me to um, continue to discuss about the trend of the application delivery and management in 2021, of course. So yes, I will continue from uh, application definition first, which is very close to developer and operator experience. So when talking about this, uh, I think we already know that Kubernetes is a great platform if you want to deliver applications or manage applications at top. But we also know that Kubernetes is not that easy to learn. It's actually kind of complicated, especially consider it actually exposed a lot of infrastructure level details like networking, security, storage to the users. But yes, Kubernetes is not an end game. That's why a lot of people are trying to build upper layer abstractions at top. And speaking of building abstractions, templating is actually one of, one of the most widely used technologies because it can allow you to defy a bunch of best practices as templates and then expose the only needed parameters to your end users. For example, you can defy a component, which name is web service, which expose the image field, the image tag, the replica number, as well as the exposed ports to your end users. So your end user can just defy three parameters to defy a web service, which can be deployed to, app, to Kubernetes and exposed to external world. This is a very simplified experience. But what's more important is the way you use template is actually a way how you end the users to customize this abstraction. For example, if one day your end user say, okay, I want to be able to defy security policy to this web service component, you say, yes, go ahead. I can give you a new version of template and you can do that. So you can see here, this is a, actually a very interesting way to build platforms on top of Kubernetes because you never ever don't want to introduce restricted abstraction to end users. Just like the traditional platform services and many, many uh, application engines, they are too opinionated to serve all the user cases of your developers. But with the power of templating, you can do that. This is actually a lot of very interesting project right now we're doing, for example, Kubevela. It allows you to declare your best practices as templates by using Q language, which is a DSL, and of course, hammer chart. So your end users will have a highly, um, I will say highly extensible way to defy application abstract, abstractions based on their own needs. Another interesting project is Gimlet. It actually, um, have a similar experience based on uh, Helm chart, allow you to define abstractions with Helm, Helm chart, and then and deliver applications use GitOps manner. So it is more like a complementary uh, tool to the existing GitOps workflow. And in, in order for you to define templates, which can be assembled into application deployment, which in, in turn give your, your end users the full extensibility, there are several other projects, for example, open application model, 
it gives you a specification or I will say principle for you to follow to categorize your templates. For example, you can say these bunch of templates are for workloads. For example, web service, backend worker, Kinetic serving workload, fast workload, or even virtual machine workload. They are all templates that describe how you run a workload. And there were other uh, category of templates, which named, for example, traits, which are all operational behaviors for your uh, work workload. For example, how to do uh, blue green deployment, how to split the traffic, how to um, declare the ingress rules based on your user cases. So this is what app, open application model bring to you. So in that case, there will be never ab, ab, abstraction lock in your system, as long as you have the model to uh, declare and categorize your templates and allow your end user to use them. Another project I want to mention uh, regarding to the um, application deployment is of course called CrossPan because it allows you to define or declare the color resources your application needs uh, in Kubernetes way. Just think about the um, um, the previous uh, previously I mentioned the application, right? The application actually composed of multiple components, including the web service I already mentioned, but it can also have a component which is the cloud database, maybe provided by AWS. In that case, how can I define all of the things together in a single source of truth, YAML file, and allow um, people to do that in Kubernetes manifest? So this is where Crossland comes in. And what's more interesting part is it gives you the way to implement the cloud provider. So in that case, you don't need to say, okay, I have to implement everything if well, I want to declare the cloud services from some other cloud provider, you don't do that. You just write a very simple cloud provider based on Crossland runtime, that's all your old state. And then you, you can use open application model or Kubevela to define the application, which is composed by your web service workload and will add the cloud database provided by Crossplan. This is the most convenient experience if you want to bring developer focused experience to your end users and make everything work smoothly with high efficiency. And speaking of the developer experience, and I think the most widely approach uh, which the community is trying to pursue is, is of course application centric. So, Kubernetes itself is complex, not because it's wrong, just because it cares too much, too many things. But for developers, it only cares about application. It only, they only care about the application. They only want to deploy the application, that's all. This, that's why, for example, um, projects like Open Application Model and Kubernetes try to bring back the application context to Kubernetes. So as a platform builder, I can actually build a application-centric platform by leveraging Kubevela with Kubernetes very easily. And you can think of that Kubevela just uh, leverage the templating uh, mechanism to allow you to pre a bunch of Kubernetes manifest templates with Q and a Helm. And you install all of the pre templates in your system and your end user will assemble them into application. And the reason they can assemble them into application deployment is because open application model is there it provides your end users with a bunch of higher level abstractions, including, for example, components, right? What are the components that compose your application? You may say, okay, uh, including the web service, including a backend worker, and including a cloud database, which is provided by CrossBank, of course. And the second concept from Kubevela is actually traits, which are operational behaviors for you. So in that case, application is composed by components plus this traits aka the operational behaviors. For example, you can declare your web service will be rolled out following a blue-green deployment strategy, which is a trace. That is how um, you allow your end users to define application deployment by fully leverage um, developer-focused primitives, which are enforced by templates designed by you. And the last concept in this kind of system is the environment, uh, because your end users will also be able to declare that my application will be deployed to staging cluster or production cluster. That is the, what where the that is what the um, ab abstraction of the environment is trying to solve. So in that case, you can see here uh, this project, uh, which is pretty new, but um, it's it's getting fully adopted by a lot of users. So this project is trying to provide your end users with a bunch of 
abstractions, but these abstractions are enforced by templates. And in that case, your end unit will have a simplified approach to declare their application deployment in a single YAML file, which name it the, which name it the application. That's why we say it's totally a application-centric experience. Okay, so speaking of the chain, I have talked about the application definition, how all of these technologies a simplified the experience of your developers and operators. But speaking of that, we also have another approach which need to cooperate with these application abstractions to make the deployment of your application very easier, which name is GitOps. So it allows your developers to declare the deployment of your application by following the Git-based process, which is quite similar to them, quite familiar to them. So that's, this is where GitOps come in. So I will pass these parts over to um, Alois. So he will be, continue ex, uh, explain how GitOps works, what benefit come from, and how the developers can leverage this workflow to uh, deliver application at scale. So, okay, Alois, here we go. Okay, welcome back. And thank you, Harry, for this deep dive. Now let's look into GitOps related trends. GitOps is becoming more and more front and center when we talk about deploying cloud native workloads. This also led to the establishment of the GitOps working group within Seek app delivery. The GitOps working group is working on a common definition, some standardization around concepts, training material, and so forth. And there's lots of people who are already actively working there. If you're interested in GitOps or are actively using GitOps, I highly recommend you engage with the GitOps working group or look at what they're working on. This is also massively driven by the fact that we see more complex GitOps scenarios emerging. So we see GitOps being used in multi-cluster environment scenarios. People usually separate their pre-production and their production scenarios by running them in different clusters. And GitOps tool chains obviously need to support this. And also we need to model stage to stage propagation, which is not just coping the artifacts from one stage to another. So you need to have stage specifics in there and you need to ways to model exactly this and how you propagate this across your Git repositories as well. What we see also emerging more and more and which still doesn't exist that much today is that different tools obviously use proprietary definitions of how they are deploying workloads. So when we talk about Canary and uh, blue-green releases, conceptually GitOps tools are doing this or progressive delivery tools are doing this in a very similar way. Still, all of them use their individual definitions and it might be a bit harder to get started there. So we hope that as the space matures more and more, that more and more standards and more uh, will be emerging there and more and more agreement across uh, different tools. Which leads us directly to the next topic, progressive delivery. Uh, progressive delivery adoption is also growing. We see uh, people using more sophisticated approaches and they're emerging more and more as people are moving uh, more and more workloads um, to Kubernetes. And there's also this trend of not just using blue-green deployments, but really using progressive delivery for rolling out workloads. One key driver here is that workloads themselves become more and more applicable to be used in a progressive delivery scenario. So two versions can really productively run alongside each other and the application services are built in a way that they can deal with this uh, rather well. Also testing and quality gating becomes tighter integrated into this process. So when a new workload gets uh, deployed in a stage, tests are automatically triggered. So this might be load tests, security tests, and then SLOs are very often also used to validate in a form of a quality gate of whether this workload should stay in the current stage or should be propagated to the next stage. So here we see the concept of SLOs of service level objectives, not just being used in production, but also being used already during deployment to validate whether all the key criteria of a healthy application are satisfied. So this moves us definitely beyond just checking a health endpoint, but looking at the service way more holistically. There's more complex scenarios as already mentioned, support for multiple environments. So it becomes way easier to configure different environments and move workloads from one environment to another in the progressive delivery pipelines and having this in a more 
easier to manage uh, approach and also the, the individual environments are easier uh, to manage and it becomes to be more of a say agreed upon approach or a better to manage approach on how to model workloads for specific environments and how to do this in a in a way that other people and other tools uh, would understand as well. As we start to integrate more tools, it becomes more and more obvious that adding a new tool usually means working with a proprietary API. That's where the CDF, so the Continuous Delivery Foundation, started a uh, SIG on events. So what the event SIG is doing, they're standardizing across application delivery um, events across the entire application delivery lifecycle. So whether it's testing, deployment, validation, new artifacts being available that are event that will eventually be understood by a wide variety of tools out there, which allows you to easily plug in a tool into an existing uh, pipeline or make it also much easier to exchange tools for different scenarios. And as we obviously move more to a progressive delivery approach where we use more sophisticated ways of rolling out applications, not just from a uh, traffic switching perspective, but also deciding which uh, user traffic we send to which version, we see a much tighter integration of what a progressive delivery does to how a service mesh is configured. So they will be much closer collaboration between the two and they will also share much more of those definitions going forward. Now, moving to the next topic about operational concerns. So, so far we talked a lot about day one operations, but obviously as we run more workloads in production, day two operations becomes way more of a concern as well. And interestingly, again, we see SLOs being also used for validation of remediation actions. So instead of just executing actions to get applications back to a healthy state, we use SLOs to really validate whether the action had the desired effect and did not have any additional side effects um, that we might not be, be checking for. So this really allows us to build massively improved reconciliation by validating against SLOs. So as you can see, SLOs really take a front and center stage here on um, how we talk about the health of applications. As we talk more about operational concerns, we also have to talk about runbooks and runbooks also start to get more automated. We want to automate this entire process for our workloads. So runbooks start to get modeled in code instead of just being verbally described, which means they're shipped along the artifact. And when you have a certain service available, it comes with its, its runbook that tools can then directly use to mitigate for certain actions. These actions, they also move beyond just being a scale-up or a rollback actions. Uh, one uh, prominent example is you automatically using feature flags that developer have added to mitigate certain scenarios. So there is a feature flag within the application, what to do when load gets too high or when certain other situations arise. These are then described in uh, machine-readable runbooks and integrated into this process. Also, actions are no longer like one-step one actions. There seems to be more and more the trend that people are modeling more complex operational workflows just the way they used to. So you pick an action, you validate whether it actually works. If it did not work, you look at where there's another action to take and automate this process, obviously eventually escalating it to a human operator if none of the automation really helps. But also there's other operational concerns um, that we have to take uh, care of, which also ties into the progressive delivery and GitOps scenarios. We have to manage how to run an application separately from the core application definition. And the QVail approach I take with using OEM um, takes this approach of modeling them in tra using traits. So traits more or less define how an application, how a workload, a service, should be run in a certain environment and how it should be properly configured. So having this model explicitly and not being part of the core manifests on the one that increases flexibility, but it also creates a separation of concerns between defining how a workload should be run um, basically and how a certain environment uh, wants this workload to be run from an operational perspective. Chaos engineering is um, also one of those increasing trends as already mentioned. Uh, just to have some numbers here, we talked to the Litmus uh, Chaos project, which is also a CNCF project. 
and they are seeing a four times increase in the number of experiments that are run. There's also a trend of moving left into pre-production. So instead of running chaos experiments solely in production, they are tightly integrated into uh, continuous delivery pipelines and GitOps scenarios where chaos experiments are run against uh, workloads when they get deployed in a progressive delivery fashion to see how those workloads behave in those scenarios so whether they still are able to cope with certain scenarios. Most experiments today are still run at a pod level. That might be a bit surprising because you would assume that Kubernetes is already taking care of most of the pod level chaos, like killing a pod and things like this. Still, it is very widely used, mostly to identify configuration issues where workloads are not properly configured or there's no high availability configuration available. So this can then easily be surfaced early on and these chaos, chaos experiments help to validate exactly these scenarios. Hypothesis checking front and center to a chaos experiment. So you always have a hypothesis you want to check against. And here also SLO modeling becomes uh, central. So we really start to see as SLOs being established as the central language spoken across the application um, delivery life cycles. You have these observability metrics really become a key component to, to chaos engineering. Uh, beyond the pod level experiments, there is an increase in network and serviceability experiments. Again, we are talking about distributed applications here and testing uh, whether distributed for a distributed application, whether all services are working properly or not is um, obviously key. So integrating this into chaos testing makes sense. And last but definitely not least, there's also this emerging trend of security chaos, so chaos experiments that focus specifically on security related issues. Um, as we start to talk about DevSecOps and integrating security closely into the life cycles, it obviously also makes sense to run security related experiments as we are releasing our workloads. So as we start to have more high level components and more prepackaged components um, available, we move from pure infrastructure definition to high level service definition, we need to store those definitions somewhere. We need to make them available to people to easily consume them. And that's why service catalogs are becoming more front and center. So obviously in a corporate scenario, you don't want anybody to run a queue control apply minus F on some file they found on the internet, how to run a Cassandra or something like that. And also most services, even if they have an operator available, they don't come in a way that they're ready to be run in production. They still require operational configuration and also configuration specific to your environment, so how you want to run and operate those workloads. And these needs to be applied. And not everybody immediately knows how to do this, or it might not be their core job on how to do this. So there are usually configurations added on top, even on these pre-packaged components um, that are provided by operators, uh, for example. By the way, this makes the life of actually both easier for developers because they get a service that actually works the way they want it to work. And also for operations because they still have the control and they can define the environment the way they want to define it. This helps us also change the mindset moving from a infrastructure related mindset to a service related mindset. You also start to really consume higher level services as a service. Like as a developer, I want to get a SQL style database. I don't necessarily know how to configure it for all environments that it's going to be deployed to, nor do I need to uh, know all of these details. I'm just going to a service catalog, um, getting the database that I want as a service that I can then use in my uh, application. So that's it from the SIG app delivery trends, what we're starting to see in a project. I hope there is something there for all of you, some interesting trends or some validation of things you're already doing or you're already planning to do. Also feel free to engage with SIG app delivery directly if you have questions, if you have real world examples that you would like to be sharing. Um, you can obviously find us on our GitHub, uh, in our GitHub page or you find us on the CNCF Slack. There are also meetings every two weeks. So every first and third Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. So feel free to reach out to us, ask any questions or engage with the wider 
app delivery community within the CNCF. That's it for today and thanks for your time.